Good morning, hello. My name is José Otávio. Uh, I would like to thank Ana Paula for the invitation. And I must say it is a great pleasure for me to speak here for all of you today to such a selected audience, um, especially because many of you are the authors or simply the authors to the papers that I use to teach history of science to my students at the Federal Institute of Sao Paulo. And so we'll be talking about some features of William Prout's chemistry and natural theology. And our main objective is to highlight an instance of a harmonious relationship between science and religion's belief that took place in England by the first half of the 19th century. We intend to do so by retrieving that book called Chemistry, Meteorology, and the Function of Digestion, considered with reference to natural theology. That book was published in 1834, and in it, William Prout expresses his particular view of this concept called natural theology. I take the liberty to start by quoting this line from Carlos Drummond de Andrade, uh, in which the poet considers, what should we think when a stone appears in the middle, in the middle of the road? Of course, the, the poet's idea is much deeper than that, but um, I shall use it to point a, a story. The story goes like this. Imagine yourself walking in a natural scenario, like uh, in the common sense of what the word nature means. Imagine a, some place with grass and trees and mountains, nothing like the buildings or the city as we know it. So, if you're walking in this scenario and you step your feet, you hit a rock, if you stumble over a rock in a scenario like this, and somebody asks, where did that rock come from? You could probably say that I have absolutely no idea. Maybe this rock may be here forever. That would be an acceptable answer. But if, because that rock looks natural, looks, it belongs in here, in there. Uh, but if instead of the rock, you stumble your feet over a watch and a, a beautiful one like that one in the picture, and somebody asks, where did this watch come from? The same answer would not apply. You could not answer the, the watch was there forever. And why wouldn't it be acceptable? Well, because the, the watch is clearly a sophisticated device. It is made of coils and cranks and pointers, and all these parts are joined together in a device that in, they are interconnected in order to fulfill a purpose, which is to mark the passage of time. So it is not a natural thing as the rock. It looks artificial. It looks an object of design. And there cannot be design without a designer. This implies the the existence of a maker, of a creator to that device. So this story is not new. Uh, William, Paley, William Paley uses this same story to introduce his version of natural theology in that book published in 1802, which was a bestseller during all the 19th century. And Paley's basic idea was that when we consider the earth this very planet in which we step our feet, where we stumble all the time, uh, the earth is much more like the watch than the stone, as it's made of several pieces, several parts that fit together and that, are com that were combined to fulfill a purpose. And we're going to see what purpose with that. This is a new version of the, of the book, which was edited by Michael Eddy, and I should not miss the opportunity to mention Professor David Knight's name from the University of Durham, who left us last January. And reaching William Prout's book. So, natural theology would comprise a collection of evidence of divine wisdom derived from the study of natural phenomena. That included the, the perception of the general laws that govern nature and a fewer number of exceptions to those laws. 
So basically the work of the natural philosophy. If we, if we understand the earth as an, something analogous to the clockwork machine, uh, the systematic study of nature would be, would, would serve us to amplify our perception of God's work. That would be the basics to the argument of natural theology by the time. Um, quoting a part of Prout's book, in order, therefore, that water might not be frozen and that air might not become irrespirable, laws must be infringed, and they are infringed, precisely where their infringement, both in kind and degree, is indispensably necessary to organic existence. So his state, I call attention for these two main exceptions that Prout mentions in, in these books, and I'll try to explain just the water case right now, and I'll save the air case for later in the presentation. So the, God would manifest his wisdom in setting a number of general laws to govern all the worlds, all, all, all of his creation, but his wisdom would be most, would be even more wonderful uh, in the few number of exceptions of these laws. And water would be a seminal example. So, the general, law, general laws of communication of heat says that when we add heat to any substance, to any material, it expands in bulk. Its, volumes, its volume increases. So, uh, when something loses heat, when something is, uh, gets cooler, this material, the general law says that this material should contract, should decrease in volume. And so it becomes more dense. Water would be ex an extraordinary example, counterexample to that, since when the liquid form of water freezes and, and gives origin to ice, to an ice cube, this ice is, uh, is more dense than the liquid form of water. So it contracts as, it, as water loses heat. So, and by doing so, it would be providential because um, if water followed the general rule, if it wasn't, a, if it had in this behavior of, of exception, during winter, when uh, a river when a river freezes by the cold, and if the ice would expand, if the ice would contract like every other material, the the solid form of water would go that would sink down to the bottom of the river, leaving the surface liquid exposed to the air. So slowly and gradually, all, the, all that water in the river would freeze and make a solid rock, a, a, a solid, solid ice on that river. And there would be no summer capable of melting all that, all that ice. So water would not flow again, life would not flow again. But the, the wisdom of God would impose these exceptions to natural laws and make the ice less dense than the liquid form of water. So as the river froze, it gets a layer of ice on the surface, which prevents the, the liquid form of, of the water from freezing. So the liquid form still flows beneath this layer of ice. And and in, the, in this way, we preserve, uh, we preserve the, the curse of nature. So Professor Bolus in Canada is, able, is even able to, skate, to ice skate or to ski over the, uh, the frozen lake. Uh, and during summer, he could go back there to swim. So uh, it is important of the, at this point to make a clear distinction of these two concepts of revealed, re, re, revealed religion and natural religion. Revealed religion, by the time, would refer to revelation. That means somebody climbs up the mountain, talks directly to God, and comes back with God's word, with God's advice for the population. Or somebody receives the revelation of God's word by talking to an emissary of God. 
uh, that will not be the case on natural religion, as I try to say. Natural religion would refer to the systematic study of God's creation, taking nature as God's creation, as a starting point, as a premise, and in trying to access God's attributes by this systematic study, so without recurring to, rev to revelation. In what context did it all make sense? We're talking specifically about England in the first half of 19th century, and all these events had some effects related to the constitution of this style of thinking. So we could take chemistry as a useful and entertaining knowledge, uh, effects of industrial revolution and the steaming gene in England as a counterpart to the French Revolution and the ascension of Napoleon uh, in the continental Europe, and particularly, particularly the continental blockade, which was uh, an attempt to isolate economically the, the island of the United Kingdom from making commerce with, the, with continental Europe. Again, um, I feel obliged to mention Professor Dave Knight as ma many of his works were very, very important for me to make my assessment of this period. So, a little bit about the author, William Prout. He was a respected medical chemist, as Brock uh, presents him. That came from a humble family from the countryside. Here in the map, there's the, the region of Gloucestershire is highlighted here in, in red. He went to normal school to the age of 13, and after that, he started to follow some seminar courses, uh, always related to in church, uh, to seminars that were given by vicars and this kind of presentation. So uh, in these seminars, he learned the basics of Latin and Greek and all that was necessary to, to reach the university. So he studied medicine in Edinburgh, became a physician and a lecturer at the Guy's Hospital in London. Um, all the biographies present Prout as an early bird. He was a person used to get up real soon, real early in the morning. And so he conducted his uh, experimental research basically on the analysis of urine and kidney stones before attending his patients by the day. Um, a medical chemist is related to the practice of dealing with the disease but not necessarily with the patients. I mean, uh, we can say a lot about the disease that people suffer from analyzing the body fluids, like urine or saliva or something like that. And Prout was, together with Alexander Marseille, Yeloili, and a lot of others of the so-called magical chemists, uh, were developing this area of, which mixed chemistry and medicine in the period. He was a member of a lot of societies, such as the Medical Chirurgical Society, the Royal Society, and so on. Some of his contributions to chemistry uh, include the quantification of carbonic acid emitting during respiration, the formation of blood components from the digestion of food, the identification of muriatic acid uh, as responsible for the action of the gastric juice, the analysis of composition of several compounds, uh, like sugars, vegetable acids, oils, and urea. Uh, all of these contributions were derived from his, in his interest in physiological processes such as the digestion and respiration. He was also interested in meteorological studies and basically in the construction of equip equipment uh, to take measures of atmospheric features, of, of atmospheric components. And among chemists, William Prout is also known by his hypothesis, which was presented on Annals of Philosophy, and I believe was Thomas Thompson's journal, uh, in two articles published in, 18, in 1815 and January 1816, uh, in which Prout states the hypothesis that maybe all the elements were multiple forms condensed by hydrogen. 
as all the atomic weights were multiples of the hydrogen. So, a little bit about the book. Um, that first book we mentioned, in which Prout expressed his vision of natural theology, was part of an ordered collection. The collection comprised eight books that all together assembled the, what was named the Bridgewater Treatise. Uh, the books was, were very expensive. The, the working class could not afford buying those books. But there are studies that reveal those books, even though the price were, had a wide use, uh, because they were present in libraries, in dominical schools, in the mechanic institutions that existed back then. So, in the book, Prout expresses the, some principles of chemistry, but he feels free to add some new theories, some particular visions uh, on developments of chemistry that he wanted to introduce. And the basic argument of the book was that design or the adaptation of means to an end exists in nature. What exactly were these Bridgewater Three Theses? Uh, this story goes back to Francis Henry Eagleton, which was that gentleman portrayed in the picture, and who was a nobleman in England and left, and uh, he bequeathed the, the very large amount of 8,000 pounds. He bequeathed this amount of money in his last will and testament to the president of the Royal Society back then, who was. Davis Gilbert, and he requested in return the, that the president of the higher society would order uh, the production, the making of, of some books. He ordered a thousand copies, at least, of a book on the power, wisdom, and goodness of God as manifested in the creation. The Earl uh, had stated in his testament some preferences which he would like to see included in these books. So, uh, they should include the variety of creatures in the animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms, the construction of the hand of man as an example of God's wisdom and, and to fulfill its purpose, and also the effects of digestion, which was done by Prout. So, the, the requirements for choosing the authors to that, to that collection comprise the three features, three main features. The recognition of scientific community, being the authors, being the candidates, preferably members of the Royal Society. Uh, literary ability, that means to write to an educated audience but composed by non-specialists. And an orthodox, devout character, that means not to write just for the money. Not sure if Prout fits all the three requirements. Well, the eight books that made the collection were written by, as we can see here, seven men of science, including professors of, at Oxford, Cambridge, physicians, professors of geology, and entomologists, and Prout uh, presented as a, a physician here. And besides those seven men of science, there were Thomas Chalmers, Thomas Chalmers, which was a clergyman. And the titles of the books, all of them published from 1833 to 1836, all of the, the titles express the kind of arguments that were presented that composed this collection. So we can see the external nature of the physical condition of man, on astronomy, on the hand, there was a book particular to talk about it, uh, on animal and vegetable physiology, on geology, on the habits and instincts of animals, and Prout's books on chemistry, meteorology, and the function of digestion. All of these features would fit the requirement to talk, to present several branches of natural philosophy with a particular point of view which was expressing natural theology. So, uh, as we have lot of, lots of students, and that's pretty fine uh, here, and it's pretty nice to see, I would like to mention 
that all, all of these books are now public domain. You can access all, any of them uh, in full on digital bases such as Google Books, Internet Archive, or Hachi Trust. And of course, these sources will never replace the pleasure we feel by scrutinizing the personal papers and correspondences of the authors, which is uh, a much better experience, but it helps. And, and we can find, you can also find some critics, some comments, some reviews of the books in digital bases such as the British Newspaper Archive or Gallica. Well, inside the book. Uh, the book is divided in three sections dedicated to chemistry, meteorology, and the digestion. Digestion always in, uh, comprehended as the chemistry of organization. So the, the author always follows a routine in the book. He explains a lot of science, then he makes a, a resume, a short resume of two, one or two pages of the scientific argument, argumentation, and then he states his theological argument, retrieving that examples, those examples of the science just explained. Uh, on the chemistry uh, section of the book, he states uh, a few chapters to organize this form of presentation. So he talks about the general laws of nature, then the forms of aggregation of matter. In this chapter, there's presented the, the water example. Then he goes to the imponderable agencies, agents, uh, named electricity, light, and heat. He talks about the elementary principles, which were the chemical elements following Lavoisier's definition as an operal, uh, as operational definition with those substances that you cannot decompose. So there were 54 uh, on Proud's book. Then he goes to the laws of combination of matter and to chemical compounds comprehending acids Bases, bases and salts. So, to illustrate uh, the instances of design and the comprehension of design expressed in the book, I've put here uh, eight, nine images of the same instance of what Prout sees as products of design. So, we can all see here uh, adaptations of means towards an end. I believe the end in this this image is pretty clear. Each image here shows an animal. You can see all of them, right? Uh, please don't ask me to say the names of the, the animals in English, because I wouldn't compress it. But there's a spider here. There's some insect. Uh, Hooper, the name. Grasshopper. Uh, a grasshopper here. I have no idea how to express this leaf insect. That's that? Mantis, a uh, mantis, mantis. Uh, a butterfly, I like the O here. So a snake, a tiger, a rabbit, and a small lizard. Is that right? Okay, so. Um, in these pictures, I, uh, I wanted to use them to express the first class of objects of design that William Prout states in his book. Proud divides the classes of objects of design in three classes, and the criteria to do that is when we, we are able to understand which means were mobilized to reach which ends. So the first case would be that one of the example on camouflage. It's when man is able to trace which means were mobilized to achieve a self-evident end. That is the case for the skin of an animal, with, uh, in which the end is the protection of the animal from predators or something of the sort, or the various phenomena amenable to the laws of quantity. Prout states all the phenomena that we can predict by calculation in this first class of objects of design. In the second class, there would be the instances in which man sees no more than the preliminaries and the results accomplished. Chem chemistry students are used to quantify or to state the initial state of a system and the final stage. And the final stage. 
But what happens, what exactly the mechanism of the transformation from the initial states of the reactants to better this way? Sorry for that. <laughs> um, but what exactly happens from the initial states of the reactants to the products of a reaction is, are formed uh, happens by hidden mechanisms, brought thought this way. So all the phenomena and operations of chemistry would be included in the second class of design. And the third class would be when design can only be inferred, for man cannot reason its means nor its ends. And Prout includes in this category the existence of fixed stars, comets, or organized life itself. Um, Prout talks about chemistry as an experimental research, as a, an experimental branch of natural philosophy. And he says, says this way, Indeed, so much chemistry is the creature of actual experimental research that its simplest truths have seldom been anticipated a priori. Thousands of years of observation and experience, for example, had not taught mankind that water is composed of two elementary gaseous principles, much less the proportions in which those principles combine to form water. Nay, even now the fact has been established upon the clearest evidence, we are unable to explain why it is so or even to comprehend the nature of the union or its result. Prout talks about the chemical process in this way. A well-trained chemist is able to predict how much of a new product will be formed in a transformation. But even this well-trained chemist is not able to predict what would be the color or the smell of that new product. So these secondary qualities that are very important in chemistry, uh, Prout would, interpret, would say that God works by mysterious ways in these chemical processes. And he's even, um, I wouldn't say disrespectful, but he, he treats, the, he talks about the mechanical phenomena as instances in which God limits himself so much that God would act in an in obvious ways when he deals with matter by mechanical means. And God would, would act more freely uh, when he acts over matter by chemical processes. So uh, there's something extraordinary about this means of operating matter on Proud's words. So in the first chapters of the book, Prout retrieves one of Paley's arguments that when the creator uh, has made all his work, he defined first laws such as inertia, the communication of movement, heat, light, um, the propagation of sound, magnetism, electricity. And these first laws were combined and defined the, the movements of matter before the existence of living creatures. So the posterior creations were made taking in account these first laws. And that would express a incredible ingenuity uh, by the creator. So we can take uh, as examples those that, were, those that are illustrated there. Like um, life of organized beings and the dominance of man over, over the creation would be one of God's ends that he had in mind from the beginning. And so the existence of organic life depends on water, uh, on water in this liquid form. But there's a narrow range of temperatures in which water exists in this liquid form. So it, Prouch takes as providential that the earth was positioned in a distance so well adapted from the sun to, to install in here uh, a range of temperature, a, a range of in environmental temperature that fits for the existence of water in the liquid form. Uh, a much more elaborated example would be the, the sense of vision. The construction of the human eye or an animal eye would, would be uh, 
determined by all the laws of communication of light, including reflection, refraction, and to, for, to form an image that would be interpreted by the, by, by the ocular system. So, about the structure of matter. Proteus pretty much confusing in this part, but um, he uses uh, an adapted version of the Daltonian atomic model, but he implants in it, he adds to it uh, a system of polarization axis that would act over each individual particle on matter. So, uh, Prout has no doubt, he's convinced that matter is made of ultimate particles and the possibility of compression would be uh, a proof of that. Um, he states that each individual particle in matter would suffer from a, pola a chemical polarization and a cohesive polarization. Those polarization axes that he represents that way uh, would be analogous to what he calls an electric polarization and a magnetic polarization. So the chemical polarization would act only among particles of different kinds. Like when hydrogen and oxygen combine, they attract themselves, they attract each other to form a molecule of water or a single particle of water. While cohesive polarization axis would act among, among particles of the same kind determining that several particles of water, all of them equals, uh, would attract each other to form a drop of water or a, or a cube of, light, of ice. And on the nature of heat, heat would interfere in this structure of matter. Prout considers heat as a substance, as an imponderable agent, and as a vibratory phenomenon. But he put all these definitions aside to deal with heat as a substance, as a compound made of the combination of the two kinds of electricity. And he states a few instances that would straight his argument, that would straight his argument. So um, when we add heat to a material, that heat would... Uh, would make like something like an atmosphere uh, reaching the places around the, per the particles that, made, that constitute that material. And this inclusion of heat would be responsible for the expansion in volume, the expansion in, vo in bulk of matter, uh, putting the particles a bit further away from each other. But we know the phenomena of latent heat, of latent heat, in which when something is melting or vaporizing, you can, st you can keep adding heat to a material and its temperature stays still. So in that case, in that situation, Prout infers that the heat is decomposing, is being decomposed in the two forms of electricity. And so this interference would make this, po this electric polarization axis to turn around each other. And that would make the positive side of a polarization axis of one particle to start to interfere and to, to be affected by the positive side of the neighbor particle. So that would be the, the reason why the particles get apart, why the particles separate themselves and become, and become more fluid. So that's the way how Prout explains the changing from solid to liquid and to gas. Um, another instance he uses to straight this argument of the heat as a compound are the lightning storms. Prout notes and emphasizes that every time we have a lightning storm, uh, it is followed by a sudden decrease in the environmental temperature. So that would mean that part of the heat that was dispersed in the atmosphere would have been decomposed by the lightning as it falls. Quite different from anything that we think today, but it was his expression. So, uh, at the end of this first part of the book, 
the Proud states his theological synthesis. And he concludes that matter has not always existed in its present form. Two, it could not have existed in its present form by chance. And three, it must have been a work of a voluntary and intelligent being. So as for Prout, the molecular composition of matter defined its ability to change, it wouldn't be probable that uh, materials would, should be formed by so homogeneous a constitution. Chance would lead us to chaos, to heterogeneity. And so he makes an analogy by stating that, do we not consider it a subject of wonder to see even two or three things by chance alike? Should we not consider the man absolutely mad who would attribute the uniform and maneuvers of a regiment of soldiers to chance? He compares the molecular constitution of matter to a regiment of soldiers, soldiers which uniform, whose uniformity would demand a commandant, uh, some external arrangement, some external supervising. Uh, I think I'll skip this one, which would bring just another, some other instances of design. He sees that on the fact that the word, all the diversity of compounds that exist in the world are made of a few number of chemical elements uh, that would express something as an economy of nature, which, which would be divine such as in cycles and all that. On the second part of the book, the meteorology, Prout says that the meteorologist's duties begin where the geologist ends. That means to consider the globe in its present condition of equilibrium. This equilibrium would be important to understand the, his view of the digestion process. Uh, Prout knew about the geological evidence that indicates cycles of convulsion and quietude. So the universe and the, and the world is not in static form. Uh, it changes. Uh, so if it hasn't always been this way, it must have had a beginning. He concludes that. Um, the end was the existence and dominance of man. So these cycles that the earth suffered from... Uh, quietude and convulsion, according to Prout, would be the preparation required for the proper mixing of the elements uh, in order to fulfill God's purpose. Um, here. Uh, on his instances of design in this meteorological part of the book, he comes back to the latent heat that prevents uh, by as heat is decomposed in, in the, his forms of electricity, it, it keeps processes of melting and vaporizing slow and gradual. Would it happen in another way? Some catastrophes could occur. Uh, like when we have permanent ice on the top of some mountains, if the, the sun of a, a normal day would be enough to melt all that ice. There would be a flood in the city downtown, in the city uh, down there. Uh, and he calls for the exceptions to natural laws. And here, uh, about the, that example, that exception on the air case, the example would go like this. Um, Prout states as a, a property of compounds the fixed proportion on the composition, on the composition. So, so uh, a, a molecule has a fixed proportion of each element that it that make their components. But air is not a compound. Air is stated as a mixture, as a mixture of different compounds such as oxygen and nitrogen. So, a, a mixture could have e any proportion. Whatsoever, like when we mix alcohol and water in any proportion. But air behaves as a compound, even though it's a mixture, because we find in any part of the globe the same proportion of oxygen and nitrogen, as if air uh, in some periods uh, behind them uh, would be a, a primitive compound. And the other instance is the interdependence between kingdoms. So, 
reaching the last part, uh, digestion is comprehended in the book as the process of organization. And this black line here represents the state of equilibrium uh, in some periods of time. So all matter left to its own, left to its own, uh, all matter left to its own would always, would always be in a state of organization below this level of equilibrium. Prout states that to organize matter to a state above this equilibrium range would require an organic agent. And he states as many organic agents as needed to make arrangements of molecules and of compounds in a state of higher, higher than the equilibrium level. So the simplest vegetables would, would have organic agents that are able to combine carbon and water to form sugar. But there would be required a second level organic agent to, to combine sugar into starch and so on until we can form an organized bean. And he states it like this, the organic agent in its simplest state may be viewed as a power which so controls certain inorganic matters as to form them into an apparatus by which it arranges and organizes other matters and does affect its ulterior purpose. Where the operations of this simple organic agent terminate, those of another and more effective organic agent may be supposed to begin, which by carrying the general process of organization a step further and so on. Um, more instances of design, like uh, he, he recognizes design in the fact that all food are made of a very small set of elements, including carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and a few others. So uh, it is providential that food is essentially composed of three or four elements. So superior animals do not need to arrange its elements, but just to rearrange such principles for nutrition. The basic organization of matter is thus left to the inferior animals or to plants. And Prout recognized that there would be objectors to his ideas. He states then, in, he classifies them in two classes, which would be those who deny the first cause in favor of the eternal laws of nature, or those who think God is beyond our faculties of reason. And Prout had, a, had an answer to reply each objection. Was he an isolated case? Historical research says no. There's a lot of other authors in the period and a lot of other authors in periods before this, before this that we are approaching here that express a different views of natural theology. And here I state the examples, I, I bring the examples of Samuel Parks and Jane Marset, uh, which wrote books of popularization of chemistry, kind of like Euler's book on the letters for the princess, for the young princess. And to finish with some contributions to teaching, I think the study of cases like this uh, may help us to highlight the dynamic and contextual character of chemistry, may present science interaction with religious, social, and political issues. And I would like to agree with our other colleague that is not here today, Thais Forato, uh, that, it, that it may reduce rejection or disinterest in relation to scientific theories. And Thais Forato refers to our students on basic education as well as on teachers' professional training. And that would be the last one. After that, there would only be a sunset to say it's over. And thank you pretty much. <laughs> Thank you. That was very good. Um, I've got a number of questions, but let me just, just ask one. Um, when, when we read Paley and, and, and others and so on, and uh, this claim appears over and over, and I've never quite understood it or, or what's behind it. And the claim is, you've said it yourself, chance leads to chaos. And... I, I, I don't know why. Uh, that seems to be a big assumption here. 
Um, and I'm just curious to know what. I see. Um, of course, that's not my opinion <laughs> as well. But back then, the objectors to this idea that uh, I would have to take to this context in which the period, they've denied uh, comprehends the, what was happening in England as a, as a maneuver, as a political maneuver uh, to prevent in England, in England something like that, that occurred in France. I mean the French Revolution. The ideal of egalité in, that came with the, with the revolution was not acceptable for the England's aristocracy. They, they would like to keep an organized uh, society based on classes. And this organization led to initiatives such as the Earl of Bridgewater to finance to, the, the act of patronage, né, to, to finance uh, natural philosophers to write those books and to conduct their research. So the idea of order and of a fixed order as stabilization, social stabilization would have something to do with this idea of an, a, a order as something thought by God. So the same sense of order that required a God to exist was applied to the social system in that particular case in English. I'm not sure if I was clear to state uh, if I could. I, I, well, that, that, that's, that's an interesting answer. I'm, I'm still not sure why that as assumption existed. I, I mean, what, what could possibly be behind uh, the claim that just because there's chance, it'll, it, it's not that it may lead to chaos, the, it, it's that it does lead to chaos. Uh, they would take that as the lack of order. The lack of order would lead us to chaos. And order requires uh, an intelligent organizer, uh, if I could say that. Right, that so order requires a, a clockmaker. Exactly, it requires a clockmaker. Uh, thank you, uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Um, I didn't know this author in particular, so you could give a very um, um, clear uh, idea of uh, of his work, and uh, I w just uh, I would like to know if you can um, explore a little more one idea you mentioned uh, very quickly, but because it's relation with uh, the biologists, the natu naturalists, that was the uh, concept of economy of nature as cycles, because it seems different from the nat naturalist's one. I see. Uh, thanks for the question. When Prout talks about the economy of nature, he refers specifically, specifically to the fact that we have a small amount of building blocks to build nature. Those building blocks would be the chemical elements, and so the, the, capa the, the capability of recycling the same elements in producing different compounds would express an intelligence based on economy. Uh, that is the basic argument, he says that. So uh, the same carbon that, that the plant is able to absorb, and he talks about the, the transformation of gases in the atmosphere conducted by the plants, he talks that, he, he labels it as a process of digestion. He says the plants are able to digest the carbonic acid from the atmosphere and to retrieve the oxygen that the animals are going to breathe and the, the same plants are going to breathe. So the, the economy is related to the few number of elements.
So this is a very nice exposition of a volume of the Bridgewater treatises that is not so well known. And so I am interested in more of the context. Um, we know Paley's work very well, Huell's work very well. Uh, maybe we do not know Prouts because uh, he lost in the debate with Berthollet later, um, so we think he is not a, a sub substantial scientist. But do we have any documentation about the relative popularity of all these volumes at that time? You have already mentioned some of the other people who echoed some of his thoughts, but um, uh, do we know about the reviews in the newspapers and how many volumes of this edition were sold versus the others? Thank you. Yes, and this author, Jonathan Toffin, is a British author and, and he had used the reference of Robert Darnton, the story of the book. And he has made a very comprehensive research on the acceptance and the uses of the Bridgewater treatises around by 30 years after the publications. So these authors, this author in particular, I, I, I don't know if it's a, a problem or it, it helped me a lot during this research. Uh, he has the peculiarity of he cannot write few words. Each, each paper of him is 70 pages. Uh, his, his, doctoral thesis, his doctoral thesis has 125 pages of references. And so uh, he, he really helped me a lot in, by doing so. And by using the referential of the history of the book, history of the book, he researched not only the authors, involved in the, the composition of the Bridgewater Treatise, but also who are the editors of the book, who are the buyers, where did the paper come from, uh, the book binding processes and all that. It's Jonathan Toffin. And it sold around 60,000 copies, which was huge. And it was expensive, as I, as I, I mentioned. The, the, whole series, the whole series was very expensive. Prout's books were sold by 15 shillings, which is, I, I think, three quarters of a pound. Three quarters of a pound. So, and uh, a, a workman back then earned 10 shillings a week. So you, you, they could not afford buying a book like this. But according to Toffan, the, the, the access to the, the series, to the collection, would be made by the Dominical schools, by the mechanical institutes, uh, and by institutions like the, the Royal Institution in London, which were made to disseminate uh, philosophical mechanical knowledge among the, among the classes. And what else? <laughs> okay. We thanks. Thank, Thank you, you very much.